Drive Discussions Europe. In this series, we discuss the forces that affect road fuels globally. Driving Discussion is brought to you by Argus Media, a leading independent provider of energy and commodity pricing information. In the last podcast, we discussed the situation of the European inventories and how they were driving the appetite or the lack of it for arbitrage cargos to come into Europe. Today, we want to touch as well upon the other side of the coin, and we will be looking at where Russian diesel cargos are going. My name is Alfonso Barocal, European Business Development Manager for Oil Products at Argus Media, and we have here today with us Benedict George, European Associate Editor of Oil Products, and John Olet, Deputy Editor of the Freight Team in London. Hi, John and Benedict, and welcome to the podcast. Hi, morning, thank you. Answer. Hello. Uh, Benedict, where Russian diesel is going since the uh, beginning of the sanctions back on the 5th of February? Well, it now looks like Russian exporters are managing to sell all of their diesel, as it were. There was a concern that some of that diesel might just be shut out of the market altogether after the EU and the UK had banned their own companies from importing it, but that doesn't appear to be happening. Roughly the same amount of Russian diesel is finding destinations globally compared with before the bans came into force. The biggest market is Turkey now, which makes sense given that Turkey is the closest diesel importer to Russia that is still permitting the trade. Almost all of Turkey's diesel imports now come from Russia. It used to be a mixture of Russian and Indian and Greek and Italian, but now that Russian diesel is so cheap, Turkish importers are naturally looking no further. There was a thought that Turkish refineries might be able to export what they were producing at the regular market price while importing discounted Russian diesel to meet domestic demand that they would usually supply. But what I'm hearing is the logistics are not there to make that work. So Turkish refineries that have traditionally supplied domestic demand can't export much of their their product, even if the economics makes sense. So Russia has captured almost the whole Turkish import market, but this is not pushing Turkish domestic production into the wider market. The next biggest markets for Russian diesel now are North Africa, West Africa, Brazil, and the Middle East. Most of those are major importers of diesel. The Middle East is interesting because it's a major exporter of diesel. It appears as though some Russian diesel is going to meet domestic Middle Eastern demand and refineries there are therefore able to export more of their own production as a result. So unlike most refineries in Turkey, these Middle Eastern refineries are already geared up to export most of their production. So it's not such a challenge for them to export more of their production. So to cut a long story short, the Russian diesel is finding buyers around the world because it's so cheap now. The discount is so wide that it compensates for the problems around Russian diesel that both the buyer and the seller have to tackle in this new world. The problems are essentially three. Firstly, it has to travel a very long way to get to wherever it's going, much further than it used to to get to Europe. So the freight is very expensive. Secondly, you can't get credit from most or perhaps any US or European banks to buy Russian diesel. So that covers most big international banks in the in the, in the Western world. Thirdly, you risk reputa reputational damage if you buy Russian diesel because the public and political attitude to Russia in most of the North Atlantic, at least, is so negative at the moment. But Russian diesel loading in the Baltic is now $225 per tonne cheaper than non-Russian diesel delivered to Northwest Europe. So in other words, around one third cheaper and that's easily absorbing the extra freight cost. So we're hearing that in Brazil, Russian diesel is actually selling 20 cents per gallon cheaper than US diesel, even though it has had to travel so much further to get there. The credit and reputational issues are different for different types of buyers. So they're actually 
seemingly insurmountable for many large oil companies around the world. The larger a company is, the more likely that it depends upon US or European banks and that it benefits from the goodwill of US and European trading partners or shareholders. So it tends to be the smaller companies that deal with Russian diesel. They can use smaller local banks and they may not deal internationally enough to bother about their reputations overseas. So they are taking the Russian diesel and actually managing to undercut their larger competitors on price because that Russian diesel is so cheap. Critically, contrary to what a lot of people expected, Russia does not seem poised to shut down any refineries or even to reduce throughput significantly because it is managing to sell all of its diesel. The discount for Russian crude oil in global markets is actually even greater proportionally than the discount for Russian diesel. So Russian oil companies can probably do better, at least it appears this way on paper, they can do better to keep as much crude as possible within Russia's borders for their own refineries and sell the diesel that they make abroad. In other words, Russian refinery throughputs and diesel exports look set to stay, to stay strong. Okay, thank you, uh, thank you, Benedict. So it seems that despite the uh, obvious problems that uh, uh, Russian suppliers find, they are they're managing, they're managing to make the uh, uh, diesel flow, and obviously one impact is the price. But in order to move uh, those cargos, uh, there must be uh, shipping uh, provided uh, by uh, by the market. So um, I would like to ask uh, uh, John, how how those ships are uh, charter and how the insurance, if any, uh, on those cargos is provided? Well, it's quite interesting, actually, because the shipping is now being done almost entirely away from the sort of standard section of the market. So we're not really seeing uh, Russian cargos, Russian origin cargos hitting the market at all. A lot of European brokerage brokerages, especially if they're publicly listed, they won't deal with these cargoes in, in, in any sort of way. So the trading is all being done mostly directly between the ship owners and the charterers. It's mostly being done off the market and away from everything else. Uh, but we can actually see what sort of um, what sort of owners and what sort of fleet is involved in this if we look at the actual vessels that are leaving the Russian ports. So a quick caveat with that is that the standard operating practice in the industry is that each ship is owned by a single company. And then that company is in turn owned by the, the owners that we're accustomed to talking about. So owners never own a ship directly. And this does provide them with some sort of um, insulation against shipping accidents and any other insurance issues uh, to basically stop it spreading to the rest of their fleet. So. We can see that since the 5th of February, there have been 131 tankers carrying products, Russian products, out of the Black Sea. Of this, 57 have been Greek, 26 have been Turkish, and 10 have been from the U UAE. Those are the top three uh, owners. Um, I must stress at this point that there is no indication that any of these have been uh, sanctionable trades. If the product is under the price cap, then these owners are entitled to load. And that seems to be the attitude that a, a lot of these ship owners are taking. They're under the price cap, then they don't appear to be having any problems with their insurance. So for them, they go into the Black Sea they for, for a significant premium over non-Black Sea trades. They pick up the Russian cargoes, they discharge it. A lot of it uh, is in Turkey. Um, they're still loading at all the main terminals. Novo, Two Apps, and Taman are the the three big ones, um, and everything still seems to be operating largely as normal. Uh, as Benedict mentioned, a lot of the shipments are to Turkey for diesel and gas oil. We're also seeing a lot of naphtha going into Singapore uh, and things like that. Um, so it's it's still operating in a fairly standard way. Uh, none of these owners have really been sanctioned. Uh, there have been no indications that it, there's anything illegal being done. When it comes to the actual freight rate being paid, it is, as from what we've heard, significantly over a standard freight rate. So to give an example, at the moment, a Black Sea to Mediterranean trade 
is a is about 450 world scale points for a russian trade you'd be a russia orange and trade you'd be looking at more like 800 to 1000 world scale points with a similar difference being seen in the baltic the baltic is somewhere around 350 world scale at the moment and you'd want to pay about world scale a thousand um so these ship owners are are making a lot of profit on this voyage but of course as we see they're not typically publicly listed um because then they would have to declare what business they were doing they would suffer reputational damage as benedict highlighted uh so on the whole that is basically the situation it's continuing much as it did before sanctions there haven't really been any changes uh, because there was already a lot of ships stepping back uh, one final point would be the dark fleet so this has been discussed a lot uh, in widely in the media we have seen a lot of secondhand sales of older ships moving into companies that are that are a lot more anonymous however a lot of the owners that we're tracking doing business in the black sea are pretty you know they're pretty public they're they're not fussed about keeping their names quiet so we don't see the dark fleet as having a particular hand in exports at the moment okay thank you uh, john obviously the uh, russian flows and the european demand have an impact in other markets like the middle east what is the current situation and the rate for the Middle East Gulf UK con 90,000 metric tonnes, the uh, LR2 market. Excellent. So, as I said, with the Black Sea and Mediterranean side of things, that we haven't seen things really change before uh, pre and post sanctions. And I would say that that is also something that we're seeing in the Mideast Gulf as well. So currently the Mideast Gulf is about $4.6 million uh, for a Mideast Gulf into UKC uh, LR2. And that's pretty much in the middle of the roughly two to six million dollar range that we saw last year and is about a million dollars higher from where it would have been at this point in 2022. Um, we can see that volumes from the Mideast Gulf to the UK continent have not been as strong in March as we might have expected, probably probably because of the size of the diesel infantries in Europe. Um, you know, we saw about 2 million tons traveling in Feb and about 1.7 million tons, I believe, traveling in March. Uh, but the key point then is the clean products that are moving on the LR2 market from Mideast Gulf to East Asia. Now, the naphtha demand in East Asia has been fairly poor. Uh, it doesn't show that there's going to be indication. It doesn't show, it doesn't look like it's going to get a lot higher. Um, next quarter we're expecting a lot of cracker turnaround in asia and we're also seeing a lot of low propane uh we're also seeing low propane prices at the moment which are encouraging these produ producers to switch from using purely naphtha to using propane as part of their feedstock mix and we're hearing that the crackers can use anywhere up to 15 to 20 percent of their capacity uh, and feed propane in there instead of naphtha so that means that we're not seeing vessels being pulled out of the mid-east gulf and going to east asia we're seeing them sit in the mid-east gulf and they're there and available whenever anybody from the mid-east gulf or india wants to move diesel into europe and that means we're just really not seeing the tightness in the market that you might expect um and then in addition to that the high uh high inventories of diesel in europe means that demand isn't necessarily as strong as we would have forecast three six months ago so on the whole um midi's gulf is pretty loose at the moment it doesn't really show that it's gonna it's gonna tighten um the one thing i would say is that 2022 uh april may and june were very strong and that's when we got really up into the six million dollar range we don't really have the same fundamentals this year but if we did this is the time that, that we're going to see them. But as I said, we're looking at a lot of cracker turnaround and low propane is, is pushing out um, naphtha, which just leaves all these ships sitting in the Mideast Gulf with nothing else to do but carry diesel. Mm. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, John. So it, it seems that we can recap that um, the Russian flows uh, keep going. And uh, in the meantime, Europe's demand is is weak. So I would like to um, to ask uh, Benedict to to wrap up the uh, the podcast, where we can see the impact from a global perspective, the impact of the Russian diesel sanctions. Well, I think the sanctions are 
probably achieving what Western policymakers intended them to achieve. For the first part, they're creating a two-tiered market for diesel globally, where Russian exporters are getting a lower price, a much lower price for their product than everyone else is getting for the same product. But the second part is that they're not shutting the Russian diesel out of the global market altogether, which was the danger. If that happened, if all of that Russian diesel was trapped in Russia, then that would be very supportive to global diesel prices. There could be a global shortage of diesel supply, and that would be potentially damaging to Western economies, which in a quite literal sense run on diesel because commercial industrial agricultural vehicles, trains, buses are mostly, almost entirely diesel fueled and some ships are even diesel fueled. So a shortage of diesel would be extremely damaging to Western economies and policymakers have quite deliberately engineered a, situ a situation where Russia is still able to sell its diesel around the world so that that kind of shortage would be less likely to appear. At the same time, the sanctions have contributed to a situation in which the EU is not receiving nearly as much diesel as it would normally. That is taking all origins together. Total EU diesel imports are much lower than they were last year now. Um, as John alluded to, this is because such large inventories of diesel were accumulated over the winter. So the EU can afford at the moment to work its way through these inventories until the point comes when there's not enough left or when demand recovers from the lull that it's been in over the winter and EU importers will need to make diesel cargoes come from non-Russian origins in volumes that we have not really seen before and this means from the Middle East, from India and potentially from China and when that happens we will probably have to expect the top tier of this two-tiered market, the non-Russian tier, to get much more expensive. And potentially it would also mean that clean freight becomes more expensive because all of these tankers, which currently are not being used to move diesel into Europe, will then have to be called into action. Um, and this is a natural and predictable cost of the sanctions, I would say. And, uh, and as I say, it will be the lift in prices will be softened by the fact that Russia is still able to export its diesel to somebody. By the way, none of this really has anything to do with the price cap at this point. Nobody anywhere in the world is paying anything close to the price cap for Russian diesel. The market is just too weak overall, overall for that to come into question. The product price cap of, of $100 per barrel will only become relevant if the whole oil market rallies very significantly. So the sanctions that we're talking about at this point, the sanctions creating this two-tiered market with, with a different price for Russian diesel, that's not the price cap. That's just the fact that the EU and the UK are not allowed to import any Russian diesel directly. All right, thank you, Benedict. Uh, excellent. And thank you as well, uh, John. Seems that um, the market will have to wait uh, to see if uh, those flows really, really, uh, really change. And uh, Middle East, Gulf and West Coast of India and East of Suez diesel uh, start flowing um, much more dramatically into Europe. Uh, in the meantime, thank you very much both for coming to this podcast. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, Thank you, John. And if you enjoy this podcast, please be sure to tune in for the other episodes on our series, Driving Discussions Europe. And for more information on Argus Global Refined Products coverage, please visit argusmedia.com slash oil products. Stay safe and see you next time. <laughs>